Welcome to episode 515 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger at sellingyourscreenplay.com. Today I am interviewing the filmmaking team of Cheston Mazel and Ellie Stamen, who just did a really independent film called Love Virtually. It's an ensemble romance where they combine live action with a lot of CGI. Again, this is a very independent film and they're very candid about how it all came together for them and what they did, did to get this project finished. So stay Stay tuned for that interview. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog and the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast, and then just look for episodes episode 515. If you want my free guide, how to sell a screenplay in five weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to selling your screenplay play.com slash guide. So just a couple quick words about what I'm working on. So this is the last episode for the um, for the year for 2023. I hope everyone had a good year. Hope 2024 is even better. I definitely got some big plans for myself and SYS. We're going to be launching the screenwriting contest again in January for sure. We're still working on securing our location for the festival in October. I'm pretty sure we'll get this worked out, but so far we have not. But the contest for sure, we're going to be launching that in early January. And I'd really like to get back into production on one of my projects. So that's going to be another big goal as well, hopefully getting into production, at least pre-production on another project. We're working on the budget list here at Selling Your Screenplay. That is our annual list of the best unproduced low-budget screenplays that have come through SYS. So keep an eye out for that. I hope everyone has some big goals for themselves that they can achieve for the new year. I've never been one that sort of makes New Year's resolutions, but I do always like to take stock of what I've done over the past year and what I hope to accomplish in the next year. Anyway, happy holidays to everyone. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm interviewing Cheston Mazel and L.E. Stamen. Here is the interview. Welcome, Lee to, and Cheston, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you guys coming on the show with me today. Thanks for having us. Thank you. It's so to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background, um, where you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment industry. And Cheston, maybe you go first and then Lee, you can follow up. Well, you know, I, I grew up in Denver and, and it's kind of funny because you know, I, I, my background is in law and business, and, and, and I really didn't set out to, to be in the industry, although I had many years ago written a screenplay, and, you know, but that was kind of like when I was much younger and, and thought that it was going to be easy to do something. And in fact, about six months before we started writing this film, Ellie uh, helped me. I, my, my wife made a documentary. Um, and uh, we we brought Ellie in, who was a who was a good friend of ours, to kind of help us with you know editing it, re-editing it, and kind of finishing it out. And um, and the day we finished it, he and you know we finally got it done. He looks at me, and says, "Well, what's our next project?" And I said to him, "I am never, ever, ever making another movie." So you know, I mean, it, it, six months later, there was a pandemic, things changed, but you know, I, I almost uh, you know got into this uh, you know without really. Uh, under you know without really realizing what I was getting myself into, so I think Ellie has a much more mm -hmm. um, esteemed career in, in the creative arts. So I think he he'd be a, a a good person to answer the question. So, but but take me back a little bit. So you were working with on this documentary with your wife, and yes. what what motivated you to do that? If you have a background in law, um, what was the motivation to get out there and just try and produce a documentary? Well, is is really my wife? You know, she. She has an incredible story. Her mother passed away when she was a baby, and she really knew nothing about her mom until she was 36 years old. And it got to a point in time where she, like, you know, it, it was like she needed to find these things out. So I really encouraged her to go interview family members because it was really not ever spoken about, mm -hmm. um, you know, in her family because it was such a traumatic thing. And her father had gotten remarried multiple times. And she really had a lot of questions that hadn't been answered. So, so mm -hmm. she went out on this journey of sort of discovery. 
And what we kind of found out about her mom is fantastic and, and really kind of amazing and really life changing. And we decided, well, let's cut these interviews into a film. Hmm. And so it was really done. Um, it was really done for very personal reasons. Not, uh, and it, I think it really what we ended up with was is a really tremendous piece of art. But it just wasn't done because we wanted to be quote unquote filmmakers per se. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. So, Ellie, yeah, why don't you give us sort of your two minute origin story? Sure. So um, I grew up primarily in uh, in, in South Florida, um, and I uh, was a terrible student and wanted to do nothing but play <laughs> gu play guitar and write music. And uh, so I dropped out of high school, started a band, um, and then the uh, being in the band, we shot you know we shot a bunch of music videos, and I got really into the filmmaking side of things, and so I moved out to L.A. and pivoted from music full time, you know, trying to make it music full time to directing music videos and then directing commercials, you know, all really low budget stuff, but, mm -hmm. and really also spent a lot of time kind of trying to hone my craft as a writer. Um, so wrote a ton of screenplays and um, I wrote and produced a movie um, that came out a few years ago before this movie. Um, but this was kind of an opportunity that fell into my lap. I'd never directed anything with, <laughs> with any kind of real budget or any, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've shot some stuff with like, you know, a small skeleton crew, but this was a, this was like, you know, my film school experience, just trying to figure it out on the go, making this movie. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It was just some, kind of something that, that, uh, that fell into my lap. Yeah. So talk about some of those early, your move to LA, you're starting to write, sounds like you're directing some music videos, commercials. Um, were you starting to do the sort of the typical screenwriter things, you know, sending to contests to the blacklist, these just sending to agents, trying to network. Maybe you can just walk us through that a little bit. Um, what were you doing and what did you feel like was having some success? What were the things you did that maybe you didn't feel like were successful? Yeah, I didn't, I don't know that I really followed the typical, the typical route that one should follow if they want to, if they want to be a writer. I was also, I really wanted to make stuff. So I wasn't trying to get stuff produced as much as I was trying to produce stuff myself. <laughs> so if I wrote a screenplay, we'd, we would maybe shoot scenes um, from that to try to, to get people interested or shoot fake trailers for things. And that's how we got, um, that's how we got, uh, the movie Knife Corp that, that I wrote and produced um, made was we shot a fake trailer for it and had someone who decided he wanted to put some money into it. And um, but a big turning point for me, I was also uh, I was also acting a bit, so I was going to auditions and really not finding any level of success at all um, until I made in that same spirit of making stuff. I made a just spec audition for. I saw that they were making a movie about Queen, so I made a spec audition for to play Brian May in the movie. And my manager at the time tracked down the casting director and uh, got it to her. And so there was, a, there was a while where I was a front runner to play Brian May in, 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 in Bohemian Rhapsody. And that like Brian Singer, who was directing the movie, loved the audition. And it, it got to this point where I was like, oh, I think this is actually happening. And then I didn't get the, I didn't get the role. And that really motivated me to pivot from acting to, all right, well, I really need to take control of my career and not wait for opportunities to do things like I need to make things. Mm -hmm. And, and that was a huge turning point for me where I was like, I'm just, I want to direct. I want to like, I want to be in control. So that was, um, so walk me through this fake trailer that you did, um, that eventually led to this feature film. I mean, we hear those stories of someone doing a short version and it gets turned into a, yeah. um, to a feature or doing something like you're talking fake trailer. So just talk about that a little bit. Um, once you had this fake trailer, what did you do with it? Did you have it? You're doing acting, you're doing these, you know, um, low budget music videos and commercials. Did you have some network at this point that you could pass it to? Did you just cold send it out? Did you go to network events? Just how did you get that fake trailer to the person that could green light the movie? First thing I'll say is like we've I've been operating very much outside of the Hollywood system, mm -hmm. so like so Greenlight is like technically it was greenlit, but it was all you know like as indie as you can possibly imagine. It's like you know a real estate guy from Boston who 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 wanted to get into filmmaking who was like yeah mm -hmm. I'll throw you some, you know I'll throw some cash into this and like let's see what happens. So like Greenlight is Greenlight is like such a <laughs> is, is a very loose it's yeah. a very loose term. <laughs> I got you. Um, so we brought on my buddy Zach and I, who wrote the script together, brought on another friend of ours 
to produce it. And that's what he did. I mean, he, he, um, he brought the script and the trailer to this, you know, real estate investor. He, he, who had a, you know, who had an interest in film and the guy's like, if you can make a couple of revisions here and you change the ending, whatever, I, you know, I'll, I'll put some money into it. So it was a very, very, um, anticlimactic, anticlimactic mm-hmm. story in terms of like, you know, we sweated out for, it was just kind of like we wrote a script and some guy gave us some money to, to make it. And, mm-hmm. you know, now, how did you, how did you take those notes? You got a real estate guy that doesn't necessarily know anything about screenplay development, giving you notes, but he's got the money. Was there ever any friction there? And just how do you appease those things? If there's some notes that maybe you didn't necessarily agree with, but you want to get the movie made. I don't think I, I don't think I had anything to do with the, re- those revisions. Cause I was producing, producing other aspects of the film. Um, so the director who was a co-writer on the movie, um, I think made those, made those changes. And I was kind of gotcha. like, if he's, if this guy's, you know, putting up the money, like we don't have anything else going on right now. Like, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't think, th- I don't think that there was anything that was, that was like compromising the integrity of the story. It was a, it was a, a ridiculous horror comedy called knife Corp starring Kane Hodder, who is uh, famous for playing, um, Jason and the Friday the 13th movies. Okay. So he's, he's like a, you know, a pretty iconic horror figure. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it wasn't like, you know, we need to make sure that we're maintaining artistic integrity or, or historical accuracy or anything mm-hmm. like that. It was like, this movie is about door to door knife salesmen who get murdered, you know, mm-hmm. like, you know, like, yeah, sure. Let's hear your notes, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So just out of curiosity, how did you and Cheston meet? Um, Maybe you can just fill us in on that. I just always sort of like to get a sense of sort of the scope or the depth of the relationship with these sorts of partnerships. How we met synagogue, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's, yeah. And I brought him home. I brought him home basically for a meal and uh, he never left. <laughs> and, you know, he'd come over and, you know, and he just really kind of became part of our family. And uh, he was, became my little brother, kind of. And, uh, you know, he'd come sleep on our couch. And, you know, he was a single guy in, in the mm-hmm. community. And we just, you know, we just became, we became really good friends over a period of time. Mm-hmm. Great, great. So let's dig into your um, recent film, Love Virtually. Maybe to start out, you can just give us a pitch or a log line. Um, what is this film all about? Uh, I mean, the log line is about four couples navigating their relationships in in a virtual world. Um, you know, much much in the vein of Love Actually, which I don't, so think I, did... actually, I don't think I actually watched Love Actually until after the, we shot right? it. Right. Yeah, right. I don't <laughs> I don't think I'd actually seen it. And where right, did but, this uh, idea but... come from? What was sort of the genesis of this story? Well, it really kind of started, you know, with you know, we were uh, brainstorming what what could we do under the restrictions of uh, of COVID. And so it started with, okay, well, uh, something having to do with an on relationship. And the first idea that we started talking about was this idea of reverse catfish, people pretending to be who they're not. But what if you took, instead of taking not attractive people pretending to be really attractive, what if you took really attractive people who for some other reason had a motivation to hide their identities, and then they were pretending to be sort of like, nobody's and and we just thought that was an ironic twist and then from there it was like okay well what are what other couples and what other sort of ironic twists um on on relationships are are sort of motivated by the technological changes that our society is going through and the cultural changes that our society is going through and sort of ultimately that's how we kind of came up with these stories and then we kind of came up with what was a through line that can keep put them all together and how do they all sort of ultimately meet up given the fact that we were planning to film this in a time when we couldn't get everyone all in a room together. Mm -hmm. So it was a combination of sort of like, um, uh, you know, thinking about what are the sort of absurd realities that technology sort of creates in relationships or can create in relationships, combined with the very real limitations that we faced at the very beginning of the pandemic, not knowing how long it would last Mm -hmm. not knowing what the conditions would be. So we really wrote it. The original script had no scene that had more than two actors in it. There were a couple scenes that were added like a year later that had a few more people in the room. But I mean, it was really, um, it was really, you know, as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of how we ended up with this kind of a crazy format. 
Okay. And so let's talk through your, um, your writing process a little bit. Um, how did you guys work together in terms of your collaboration? Were you guys in the same room? Were you in different rooms? Um, you doing zoom calls, maybe just walk through sort of some of these logistics of how you guys worked together and wrote this. Yeah, we were in separate, uh, we were on other sides of the country. I was, I happened to be in Florida right when the pandemic broke out. So I ended up staying with my parents for, for a bit before going back to LA um and Cheston was still in LA at the time um yeah so we 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 would my process would be, I would go on like long walks around the neighborhood we'd be on the phone kind of just iterating hmm. on on these ridiculous ideas and scenarios and then I'd go sit in the backyard and you know and write but yeah it was a lot of a lot of zoom calls and using software where we kind of look through each other's work and rewrite mm-hmm. and rewrite and and then how does this move along in terms of the writing process structure? Do you guys do a lot of outlining index cards? Um, do you just get into something like final draft and start actually writing script pages? Maybe just walk us through that process. What did it look like for you guys? There, there was one secret weapon that actually really helped a lot because of the complexity of like, how does everybody know each other and how do they interact? And, and so um, I, I did... I kind of drew a, a graph, like a very weird looking graph, but it was just, I just put all the, the names of the characters and then just sort of started drawing lines like I was trying to solve a murder from from person to person, just figuring out like, all right, what is the connection there? What is the, you know, how does, how, what, what does the interaction look like? When does it happen? So I had this very messy looking graph that kind of helped um, work as an outline. And then we did some, did we, I think we did some outlining, right? Yeah, we did. I mean, I think it was an, it, it was an, a process that you kind of you write some stuff and then you got to kind of figure out how does that fit with this and you change it. And it wasn't like, you know, s- since then we've worked on some stuff that we were more deliberate from day one, you know, stuff that hasn't been made yet. But like where in terms of the outlining and graphing and mapping it out kind of a process, I think that's really a, a, a very useful process. It always works better when you're in the same room. So when you're on the other side of the country, um, you know, th- there's a lot more passing stuff back and forth and then just talking it through. Mm-hmm. And then what about just once you're writing, is it just, did you divide up scenes? Um, you take this scene, I take this scene, or one person writes a scene and the other person rewrites the scene. How does that work? Just maybe again, walk through that process for you guys, the actual writing of the script pages. I think it was a, it was a combination of, of, of that. Like, I think there were scenes where like, I didn't want to write you know, or scenes that Cheston didn't want to write and we'd kind of divide and conquer. And then we'd also like write and rewrite each other's scenes. So it'd be like, I just wrote this, take a look at it. And stuff would get uh, just passed back and forth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there was one yeah. scene we were writing on set five minutes before we shot it. So, you know, <laughs> that was that was kind of an interesting experience as well because it, we realized a change needed to be made. So it, was, um, it was very much a dynamic. What? Yeah, they were also rewrites um, yeah. after the fact. Like we had our first version of the movie and then we, you know, wrote a bunch more. Like, we, you know, we did reshoots and had stuff mm-hmm. that we just kind of realized after the fact that we're like, all right, I think we need this to, you know, I think we need some more connective tissue here. Or we really didn't, we didn't, really didn't explain this relationship enough or this doesn't quite, you know, so there was a, uh, there was stuff that got shot like a year and a half after the, after principal photography mm-hmm. that was, that was written later. I was going to say also like the whole introduction to the movie, the movie starts totally differently than originally what we had written. Mm-hmm. So we kind of, you know, between the, the new scenes that we had added and redoing the beginning, we were able to kind of fix a lot of the stuff that maybe we didn't have the vision when we first wrote it to, to realize needed to be done. Gotcha. How do you guys approach screenplay structure? Um, it sounds like this has a number of storylines going on simultaneously, um, but there's sort of that Blake Snyder, Sid Field, real clear paradigms with act breaks, beginning, middle, and end. Um, what is sort of your approach to something like this? And as I said, it sounds like it's a little bit unique. It's not necessarily one A story that really controls right. that structure. Um, but how did you guys approach structure with something like this? I mean, for for this one, we didn't, we, you know, we didn't really use the Blake Snyder beat sheet, which I ordinarily do for like for most projects. This could, but because this was an ensemble piece and it's, you know, like it, the structure doesn't quite work, you know, to, to fit into mm-hmm. those, those like rigid parameters. Um, but I do think that there's still, there's some rhyme and reason to it. I don't know, you know, I don't know what, <laughs> like, uh, where it comes from necessarily like i don't know what what that where how you'd categorize what our structure is um 
uh, we actually did at one point in time try to go back and fit stuff in to the Blake Snyder paradigm. And like, there was no way to get this to happen on that page and this to happen on that page. But we did go back and kind of like, okay, like let's, let's at least make sure that some of like, you know, that, that there's, that there's a, you know, there's the process of meeting everybody then there's the process of everyone getting to the club and then there's what happens in the club and, and, and towards the end of the film and each story a character had to have their arc. Mm-hmm. So like it, it, you, we did actually, we were informed by that, but that wasn't until we'd already finished the script. You know, mm-hmm. you know, we really just kind of like, we, we broke, we broke the rules or didn't pay attention to the rules, whatever it is. Uh, I think that to the extent that it works, uh, we got very fortunate that we managed to make it work, but it was a lot of slicing and dicing and chopping. I mean, we were even reorganizing, putting reorienting scenes after, in the editing process mm-hmm. of moving things completely around and you know, getting rid of scenes. And so, it, it, you know, I wouldn't say that we would do it the same way again going forward, mm-hmm. but um, it was a very creative and, you know, it fit my sort of more entrepreneurial um, style of doing things generally, which is you try things and, and if they don't work, then you try something else, you know? Mm-hmm. And so there, there was a little bit, you know, I, I don't know that I would recommend to screenwriters necessarily to do it the way that we did it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Although I'm very happy with how it worked out. Uh-huh. What does your development process looks like? So once you guys had a first draft or even a second or third draft that you kind of liked, um, how do you start to get notes and how do you move it beyond that? Um, did you have some trusted actor friends, some trusted producer friends, you sent it, you got notes, and then maybe you can talk about a little bit um, about that. How do you then interpret those notes and, and execute those into uh-huh. your screenplay? We were, we were in go mode, like, but like draft one, and again, not something I recommend, but but like V1, we're like, mm-hmm. we're starting pre-production. You know, like we had like, we got like, you know, fade out and it's like, all right, like this is happening. We're making this movie now. So like mm-hmm. I sent it out to some people for notes. People were like, yeah, this isn't ready to shoot yet. And I was like, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. And uh, <laughs> and that was our note. That I've was said our that note. myself numerous times. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and, and then when we shot the whole movie and then we were like, Oh, they were right about a lot of these things. Like this wasn't quite like there were things that we needed to iron out that we just didn't during mm-hmm. during the writing and principal photography. And I sent the first cut uh, um, out to a producer friend of mine who's like like made huge movies. Like he he produced Inside Man with Denzel Washington and whatever. And he 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 watched the movie. And I was at <laughs> I was with my family. I was with my, my wife and her family at Epcot. And we were like taking a picture and this guy, I was waiting for this call back from this guy to watch the first cut of the movie. And I was like, he's going to love it and whatever. And he's like, Hey, yeah. So I watched it and it's like, maybe you should cut it down to like a five minute short film. And I was like <laughs> sitting there like, and everyone's like smile. for the-. And I'm like, this is the worst news I've ever gotten in my life. And so we ended up going back and kind of rewriting, like f- figuring out how to retool it. And we, 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 we you know created a whole new intro for it and redeveloped some of the characters and shot some more stuff and then I sent him the, a newer cut of it and he's like cool you you made the movie work now but there was that moment of like okay we're missing some really key elements just oversights in our writing where where we just didn't realize how crucial it was to um to give the audience something to connect certain characters too and to like and to be rooting for certain characters like the Roddy character was just underdeveloped when we wrote the script and we Mm -hmm. didn't realize oh we really need to like develop this character more I think there was another problem that I think writers you know are going to run into and that's that we in our own brains had made all these connections of all these narratives that it all made perfect sense but just but that's a bias that we have as the creators of the stories because these characters are fully developed in our own minds and our own brain. So when this one says this, the subtext and all those other things are, are just obvious. But it's not obvious to the audience because the audience is just getting to know these characters and they're just mm-hmm. figuring out who are these people and what's going on. And there's also subtleties and nuances which you're not going to catch you know, the first time you watch something. So I think we learned some of those kind of lessons the hard way um, you know, but I think that's a pitfall that any, any writer could potentially mm-hmm. fall into is just, you know, knowing the character so well and assuming that the audience is going to make the connections just because they're there in, in, in subtle terms, when in reality, sometimes you have to, you know, you, you just have to lay more of a foundation and, mm-hmm. you know, you, you can't rely on the audience being so like, 
on top of everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So it sounds like from the very start, your intention was to write this script and then go shoot it yourself. So maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Um, Once you had a draft that you guys were at least happy with, um, what were those next steps? How did you go out and start to raise money? And how did you go out and start to bring on cast? There was a little more than that. It was like, part of it was like, how are we going to make this? You know, like I, for, you know, raising money for any movie is an impossible thing. And it's usually like a chicken and egg thing. And, you know, I, I, we could spend the whole time talking about that. Let's just say I was willing to take a, a certain personal risk that was substantial in order to get the ball rolling. Mm-hmm. But I think don't think it was about just that. I think that we were like, OK, we don't know anything about animation. So, you know, I was literally, um, you know, putting out on Facebook. Does anyone know anything about VR? And someone's like, well, here, talk to this guy. And so I'm like asking him about VR. And then they, somehow we made it to a guy who is a computer guy who worked on a project who hooked us in with the producer. And we met this producer. Um, and he had worked on a lot of animated projects and things like that. And, you know, he read it. And we were like, well, we can't really afford to pay you what you'd normally make. But, you know, would you do it for X? And he was like, you know, he had nothing else going on. It was COVID. It was a pandemic. And he was like, okay, you know, and so, and then when, then once that happened, it's like, okay, now we're, you know, Ellie was, um, you know, actually he, he became very close friends with my wife's cousin who was housemates with this fantastic production company and production team. And Ellie reached out to them. Like, and so we started figuring out, well, what would it cost for them to do the principal photography for us? And then we, you know, had to go through, you know, a whole process of how are we going to get cast when no casting directors would talk to us. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, 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 and, you know, we had very entrepreneurial people involved and, and we hustled a lot and we did a lot virtually. And, mm-hmm. you know, it was Cast, definitely not the way. Yeah, casting directors literally would not answer our call. I, there was, I had a neighbor who was a casting director and she worked on like Boogie Nights and a bunch of other and whatever. And uh, I was like, I was friendly with her, you know, and she, I was like, hey, would, was this something you'd, like you know be interested in working on it. she's like no <laughs> you know just <laughs> flat out like and i was like can you point me in the direction she's like no but with your little tiny budget nobody is gonna like no one's gonna cast this like you're not gonna get it. and she was she was right no like we i brought on my my manager at the time was literally the casting director on it and he's just a bull in a china shop and would just hmm. you know was really good at getting agents to take him seriously and that's how we, we cast this movie. But yeah, cat, like the traditional casting director, like, like no one would take our calls. It mm-hmm. was, it was a little disheartening at first, but. And so that's yeah. ultimately your manager was able to get um, Sherry Otero and Steven Tobliski. Um, he was able to get those, some of that name, those name yeah. talents on um, because of his relationships or whatever. Totally. Yeah. Well, it, he at least got it to Steven and Steven liked it. He also got a lot of people, got things to a lot of people who didn't, weren't interested. So, you know, it really took a lot of, mm-hmm. you know, footwork and, and Sherry, you know, came on really cause she wanted to work with Steven. So, you know, it's kind of like, it's the same chicken and egg thing in, in anything in Hollywood. Like once you get one person who mm-hmm. someone else wants to work with, whether it be a, a, a name so then you can get money or a, a, a name so you can get another name, and it's, you know, it's really getting that first person who is that people will take seriously attached to the project. And then it, 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 it's not easy, but it allows you the opportunity to open other doors. And I think that was for us, you know, a bit, you know, a big way that we got this done is just through, you know, brute force and, you know, and, and just keeping pushing and doing whatever we could you know, to, to make this happen. Mm -hmm. And then once you guys had a a finished film, what were some of those next steps? Did you do the festival route? Did you start contacting distributors? Um, Maybe you can talk about that a little bit. How did you actually bring this film to market? Finished film is also a a relative term because we've had, (laughs) there've been so many iterations of it. And it, Mm -hmm. it, it took a very, I mean, animation VFX. I mean, that stuff just took so long to get done and to get right. And then even when that, when most of that stuff was done, there were still, Okay, is this the is this the tightest version it could be? Do the are the jokes landing? Are things you know are the right. things that we can cut out? Are the things we can, you know? So um, we did, we did. Um, well, Justin, you want to take the yeah? So yeah. so we we along the way, like we did show it to some people who might be in that space. We did at some point take on a uh, like a producer's rep, you know, which who who was going to uh, you know a group that was going to like introduce us to distributors. And things like that, but you know, they and they brought us several offers. 
But the offers that we got were incredibly uncompelling because, you know, in the, right now in the, the distribution game for a, a small independent film, even if you have a couple names, they're, they're not the biggest names in, in Hollywood. The distribution game is pretty broken because basically what we found was, look, no studio is going to take on a film like this. It's too small. You're not going to be able to go to no, uh, no streamer is going to pay in advance for it if you didn't get into festivals. So we we applied for a few festivals, not a ton of festivals, but um, we didn't get into the big ones because they they weren't taking this kind of content. You know, we didn't have any political, we weren't calling them, we didn't have political people trying to get us in. And we were, we had, it was satire that pushed a lot of buttons when they were looking for something that was a little bit more, um, you know, a, a little bit more in line with a certain ethos that, that, that the films were having and not something that was sort of going to be controversial in the way. Um, and so we just kind of, the one festival we got into out of the four or five that we applied to, we won Best Picture. Hmm. And that was the Los Angeles Comedy Film Festival because they wanted comedy. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, to have, so we got it. So that was a nice boost to get Best Picture. And so, but nevertheless, the offers we were getting from distributors, and this is really, I think, the case that of, of the, this is the state of affairs for independent film, is they're like, no MG. And by the way, uh, you know, we're, we're the, all the expenses are charged back to the account. And then they're going to take 20, 25, 30%. And all they're going to do, because no one's doing theatrical for this kind of a film, all they're going to do is they're going to get you up on all the platforms. And so, and then, by the way, you're probably still going to have to spend money to market it yourself. And you're probably still going to have to buy, get your own PR. So what are they doing? They're not really, most of these distributors nowadays, at least for things that are going straight to online, aren't doing much more than aggregators, mm -hmm. uh, except for they're taking a piece of the action in a significant way. So... Um, you know, so we, we, and I was fortunate if I, I had, um, a relationship with someone who knew the people over premier digital and, and we ended up going with them and we're very, very happy because, you know, we were able to maintain control of, of, you know, the, the PR and the, and the, uh, and the marketing and things of that without kind of bringing someone in who wasn't really going to make a real commitment to our project and expect quite a bit, um, of, of our upside for having done almost, for having done very little. And so I think that um, oh, that's that's the reality a lot of independent filmmakers are facing when you go to a distributor nowadays, because if you don't have an MG, if, if, if the thing doesn't take off, they have no real reason to invest all that much in marketing or, or your film. Now, some of them have some skills. Some of them will be really helpful. Some of the distributors might get you um, get you into doors and things like that that you may not get other ways. So I'm not saying, I mean, everyone advised us against doing it kind of the way we did it. But, you know, but the truth of the matter is, if we listen to what any normal person would advise us to do, we would have never made this film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and believe me, as someone that's been on the front end trying to find distribution for independent films, I second everything you just said there. Um, and I hope people really listen to that if they're thinking about making an independent film. Um, so how can people see Love virtually? What's the release schedule going to be like for it? So on November 7th, it'll be available on... Um, it'll be iTunes, Amazon, Google Play, DirecTV, Dish Network, EchoStar, all the cable channels, Voodoo, Voodoo and Fandango. And uh, it'll be available for, for uh, pay-per-view and to purchase um, on November 7th. And, uh, you know, we'll, the, 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 the subsequent windows will, will happen subsequently uh, down the road. But that's really what mm -hmm. we're focused on now. Perfect. Perfect. And um, I just like to end the interviews by asking the guests, is there anything you guys have seen recently that you thought was really great? Um, HBO, Netflix, Hulu, anything you're watching TV or movies that you just think our screenwriting audience might, um, might be interested in checking out. I'll give this one to Ellie. He's yeah. the expert on so these I'll, things. I'll, I'll, I'll plug, um, I'll plug, uh, I'll plug a few movies. They're not like the most recent, but just in the other independent, um, smaller creators who have done exceptionally well now. Um, I thought I love my dad was great. Hmm. Um, uh, I liked uh, the art of self defense. Um, hmm. I thought it was great, and um, Cha Cha Real Smooth. I thought it was okay, also perfect. Yeah, those are all great recommendations. Not not films I've checked out, so um, I'll put those on my list. Yeah. And what's the best Watch. way for people to keep up with what you guys are doing? Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, anything you're comfortable sharing. I will round up for the show notes, and people can click yeah. over to it. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Um, I don't know if we have a Twitter, but it's Love Virtually Movie. Okay. Um, on all the socials. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and we're just getting those rolling. So anything people do, come follow us. <laughs> we'll help us kind of get some yeah. momentum because we really want to 
get the word out there. About yeah, perfect. So what are you guys doing on your TikTok channel? I, and I'm looking for some actual tips here because my TikTok channel really isn't doing much. <laughs> um, we are, I don't know, you got to check out the TikTok. To, okay, to see I'm going to yeah, check yeah, it out. Yeah, so but, perfect, perfect. But we so, really just, we really just started that stuff because gotcha. we really want to, you know, the, in this day and age, people are, their attention is so small. We didn't want to invest mm -hmm. too much, too far ahead of the launch. We gotcha. want people to be able to see something and then go watch it. Yeah, And yeah, so sure. the, over the next week, there's going to be a lot more rolling out on those channels. Perfect, perfect. Well, congratulations getting this film done. Thank you, thank thank you. guys for coming on and thank talking you. with me for a little bit. Good luck with it and good luck with all your future projects as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. We'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. I just want to talk quickly about SYS Select. It's a service for screenwriters to help them sell their screenplays and get writing assignments. The first part of the service is the SYS Select screenplay database. Screenwriters upload their screenplays along with a logline, synopsis, and other pertinent information like budget and genre, and then producers search for and hopefully find screenplays they want to produce. Dozens of producers are in the system looking for screenplays right now. There have been a number of success stories come out of the service. You can find out about all the SYS Select successes by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash success. Also on SYS podcast, podcast episode 222, I talk with Steve Deering, who was the first official success story to come out of the SYS Select database. When you join SYS Select, you get access to the screenplay database along with all the other services that we're providing to SYS Select members. These services include the newsletter. This monthly newsletter goes out to a list of over 400 producers who are actively seeking writers and screenplays. Each SYS Select member can pitch one screenplay in this monthly newsletter. We also provide screenwriting leads. We have partnered with one of the premier paid screenwriting leads services so I can syndicate their leads to SYS Select members. There are lots of great paid leads coming in each week from our partner. Recently, we've been getting five to 10 high quality paid leads per week. These leads run the gamut. There's producers looking for a specific type of spec script to producers looking to hire a screenwriter to write up one of their ideas or properties. They're looking for shorts, features, TV, and web series pilots, all types of projects. If you sign up for SYS Select, you'll get these leads emailed directly to you several times per week. Also, you get access to the SYS Select forum where we will help you with your logline and query letter and answer any screenwriting related questions that you might have. We also have a number of screenwriting classes that are recorded and available in the SYS Select forum. These classes, these are all the classes that I've done over the years, so you'll have access to those whenever you want once you join. The classes cover every part of writing your screenplay from concept to outlining to the first act, second act, third act, as well as other topics like writing short films and pitching your projects in person. Once again, if this sounds like something you'd like to learn more about, please go to sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. Again, that is sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing screenwriter and producer Brian Cantrell. He just produced a cool low-budget horror film called Abigail, which stars his daughter in the lead. He's got an interesting story. His daughter, as I mentioned, is an actor, and he actually did a lot of networking as he would drive her around to various auditions. And in fact, this film, this horror film that he just did called Abigail in a roundabout way came from that bit of networking. So there's a lot of great lessons in here um, that he brings to this episode. And also he is a writer with a number of his own projects in development. So we do talk about that as well, what he's doing to push his own projects forward. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. That's the show. Thank you for listening.